Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I want to start with a, a picture from this building, which I have to say, I, I, I love this, uh, this venue, and especially this building, and especially when it's not on fire. Um, <coughs> and I think we were really dumb yesterday, but <laughs> so if it starts beeping, I will be leaving this time. Um, this is, if you, if you have not done it, I suggest you walk up this, this round arc. You can walk all the way, all the way up to the um, top. Um, and uh, on that walk, you will see that stair somewhere where it says the beginning. Um, I want the beginning of my talk to be the end of my last talk on a, on a very similar um, topic. And that was an idea um, that I was proposing, and that was the realization, first of all, that every gem that you start, you start, the gem starts with a namespace. When you develop a Rails app, you never start with a namespace. Um, and so if you compare the two, a gem is like a box, and you put a little label on it, and a Rails app is, uh, let's say, a gorgeous infinite nothingness and with all the bells and whistles of active, active everything. Um, <coughs> to, to uh, get a gauge of how relevant that is. Who writes Rails apps on a daily basis? That's about two thirds, maybe three quarters. And who writes Ruby but never touches Rails? That's way less, okay, but there's still a few. So I hope, um, I have the feeling that for the second group, what I'm going to say is going to apply a little bit less, um, maybe because of not, Rails not being around. But, um, so the idea from, from my last talk was, the next time you start an app, just put everything in a namespace. And I, I ended with this, what I found to be an awesome finishing slide. Give yourself a box so you can start thinking outside of it. Um, with the idea that if you have a gem and you, you give something a name and you put things inside of it, you can open that box and you can go WTF when you find something that obviously doesn't fit in the box. If you do that, try to do that with a Rails app, you don't have a box, you don't have a name, so everything's gonna fit. The best game you can play is um, what doesn't belong with the others. You know, uh, I don't know, red, green, loud, what doesn't belong with the others, and you're gonna know it's loud, but if you look at your typical Rails app, what are you gonna have? You're gonna have a user, uh, I don't know, company, roles, and then, I don't know, the, the tulip pricing engine that you wrote, and then the, the marketing, part for that in a, in a store. You're gonna tell me that you can still play that game and find out what may or may not belong to this app? It's very hard just because it kind of pushes in the direction of just putting our app, uh, putting all of our app in there. So what I wanna talk about today um, is component-based Ruby and Rails architectures. And uh, I, pr I promise you I put this slide in before that happened. If uh, <laughs> I may want this button more desperately than you, trust me, um, but stop me um, if I'm going too fast, um, because I want to talk about large applications. And one thing I heard about them is you just never build them. Um, so I work for Pivotal Labs, and we maybe start a new project every few weeks, and many of them are greenfield, so many of them are tiny when we start. Um, but you heard from Matt yesterday, we have pretty big apps as well. Um, and for every app, since kind of our definition of success is that a client can stay successful after we leave, um, what we have to strive for is some sort of architecture where you can develop an application well over time. So we have to think about the app being larger than it is when, while we develop it, um, despite TDD and all. Um, Sandy Metz wrote her awesome book last year and gave a few talks, and the one that I was, she, I don't know if she said it in other talks as well, but she said, your app is out to kill you. You know, the growing complexity of your app is going to chase you, and if the app were a bull, you might feel like that guy. And um, th that is very exciting, you know, for the next second that is exciting, for the next <laughs> hours or days that is painful. Um, who has, okay, this is maybe a bit drastic, but who has felt like their app was behaving like that bull to them? Okay, so I have felt like that as well. They, they, they are not typically that fast quite the opposite, but um, they behave like something that, you're, that is too big to handle. So what I want to get to is for us to be more like this guy, calmer, in control, with sunglasses and a hat. Uh, but I don't really like bullfighting, so I actually want us 
to be this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Just hanging out, and uh, I have to admit, I'm somewhat, uh, being a consultant, I'm, some, I'm a little bit maybe that mercenary. I want to go home <coughs> at 5 on a Friday night, um, and I think this guy is probably the one who's going to do that um, the most successfully because he's, he's just fine probably all week long. <laughs> so um, this never built large apps is part of a larger quote from uh, Justin Meyer. The secret to building large apps, he says, is never build large apps. Instead, break your application into small pieces, then assemble those testable bite-sized pieces into your big application. But how? Um, he was, I think, talking about JavaScript. I'm talking about Ruby and Rails. Um, you can tell from the font that you're supposed to read this slide. Um, so this, I'm going to use a tiny uh, sample application throughout this talk. Um, and this is where you can find it. If you cannot read this, after all, just search for GitHub and the next big thing, and I think it comes up first. I promise this thing is tiny, and it does only one thing. So it's an announcement page. You can announce uh, whatever you have to announce, and people can sign up for updates. So. Um, I can, I actually don't know. I spelled with two N, but I don't know if my Twitter handle is only one. Well, see, that's how often I Twitter, uh, tweet. Um, so the server thanks you for signing up, and I just press return. And when I made this sample app, I had to come up with a little bit more than just that to actually have something to move around. So I realized pressing return makes it really easy for me to do that many, many times. But of course, I only want my email address to be registered once. So I thought I'll give the server the ability to kind of uh, feedback the uh, level of annoyance that it feels while you're just continuing to press return and annoying it. <laughs> so at some point, it'll just, it'll just freak out. Ah, oh, there's the freak out picture didn't come. Let's try again. Yeah, the wireless is gone. Um, it's an awesome picture of a guy with a lot of hair, though. Um, OK, so I need your help, though. I need you to imagine something really big. Um, because that app is tiny, and I'm going to make examples um, of refactorings or re-architecturings that don't make sense in that app. So bear with me, and always imagine something very big. Um, I'm going to go through three, uh, no, not three, eight ways of architecting this application. Um, and I have roughly two minutes for everyone. So let's start with uh, number one. Um, if you check out that um, GitHub uh, project, you will find those eight steps as tags, and um, you can roughly follow the steps that I'm taking. Okay, so. First one is um, a normal Rails application. It's all in one. Let's look what's happening. There is a tease controller here. Uh, it has two actions, new and create. And let's briefly see what happens. Uh, no surprise, it's not a well-written method. John would refactor this rightly. So, um, so uh, we're trying to find the entry that you, you gave this, um, this form. If we find it, we update a tries on that entry. And uh, we put it into this annoyance meter. It'll tell us how annoyed we are at this point. Um, and we'll, we'll feed that back to the, uh, to the client. If we don't find the entry, we're just going to say thanks for signing up. And, and then there's a bit of you know, catching of unexpected cases. Um, but that's pretty much what's going on in this controller. Now, there's a, there's a model back in this. It's entry. It has the email address and, and a number of tries. And there's this annoyance meter which uh, content of which is not really important. It just derives a new string out of these, uh, these counts. So I, I suspect that everyone has um, seen this. Um, and I will, for, the, um, for this talk, have to assure you that in every one of these stages, you can run the tests. And if I didn't pick the wrong commit, then they will, they will pass. Um, so I have tests, but I won't show them. Uh, I'll just be moving them around for every stage. Um, and adding new ones where there is a new, um, a new test to be written. Now remember, uh, I said this beginning at the beginning of every Rails app, it's kind of this this infinite void. A good picture for that is probably um, a, a big dump site. And I've already asked you if you ever felt like the guy in front of the bull, then maybe you also felt like the driver in that um, bulldozer or whatever that is. Um, the, 
The reason I'm saying that about this tiny app is that there's two things in there that are now um, indistinguishable if you look at it from like 30,000 feet as to what they do, how they're connected, if they have any structure, um, it pretty much doesn't exist. So for all intents and purposes, if you just multiply, extrapolate from these two, uh, two classes to say 50 or 100, you have no clue who's interacting with whom, what's going on, and why. Um, unfortunately, that this doesn't look very chaotic, but if, you, if I were to write 100 class names here, um, it would be chaotic, and you would not be able to assess any sort of structure just by looking at those, those classes. So a first way of getting structure into this application is modules. Um, the plus we get from that is a higher level structure. So, and you've all probably seen this one too. Um, not much changes, the controller doesn't change at all except it now references to entry and the annoyance meter um, within their namespaces. Um, the annoyance meter, the um, annoyance left the class name, it's now on a module. I moved some other stuff around that was mainly for testing. Um, so we now have this structure. And if we um, come back to this analogy, then maybe we have moved from a dump site to a recycling yard. And recycling yards are awesome. I should know this because I remodeled my house, and you visit those places very often when you do. Um, you can point to a corner of the recycling yard and say that's where the scrap metal is. However, if you've ever gone to such a place, you also know that you stick the hard to recycle stuff under your car because you're not a nice citizen, and then you try to pawn it off to the recycling yard um, because you just want to get rid of it, and it's so hard to get rid of. Um, people do that all the time. Stand in front of the, the clean wood, and then suddenly non, not so clean wood gets uh, thrown on top. What does that mean for code? It means there is structure. I have now an email sign-up module and an annoyance module, um, and in that is more, are more classes, but there is no guarantee that these classes are A, independent, or B, you know, um, are actually doing what they say. I can't prove it. That's why I kind of you know, put, the, put the rectangles over each other. But at least I, I didn't have to write entry anymore because I now have a higher level concept, um, that being the, this email sign-up module. The third step is what I want to call, or if I want to improve on this, then I've already kind of hinted at it, I would like to go to the next step, which is prove that these two pieces are independent. Um, I call it the gem component app, um, and I may need to explain a little bit more about this step. Um, so first off, you're, you're not seeing that engines folder right there. We're not looking at that. We're looking at the annoyance gem. Um, so I made a folder gems, and I put uh, an annoyance folder in there. And actually, this is a complete um, folder structure of a gem. We have a gem spec. It defines our annoyance gem, and I should fill probably, probably fill in this data. Um, but there is a, a gem file which tells us that we're running tests with our spec. And magically, this may be the only time we need to look at tests. Now, I have tests now in this gem that if I go into that subfolder, I can now independently run. And because... Um, of the way our spec will load these files, I can prove to you that these tests for um, the levels and the meter of the annoyance will pass without knowing about email signup. Again, doesn't matter here, matters a whole lot if you're dealing with, with tens or hundreds of files. I can prove that this thing is independent. Now, um, I'm curious, how many have seen like just shoving a gem like this into the subfolder of an, of an app? Okay, that's not, so everyone else should, should uh, start doing that. So you could ask me two good questions. One is, um, why am I not get, using Git submodules? I'm not smart enough is the answer to that. Why am I not using a different repository? I'm too lazy is the answer to that. Uh, you can just do this. So how do I use it in the application? Um, the gem file of the main application, you're not seeing this line deletion, um, is uh, now just pointing to an annoyance gem and it's just referring to it by its path. That's all there is to it. This, this will be loaded. I can, uh, I can access it like before. And if I look into the T's controller, um, uh, we are still down here just loading that annoyance meter. Nothing else special has happened. The only thing that happened, if we go back to this 
um, to these slides is we now have provably independent tests. We have provably independent code within that one component that we just extracted. Um, and in, in the words of Eric Evans, um, choose modules that tell the story of the system and contain a cohesive set of concepts. We're now able to prove that a set of concepts, namely within that uh, gem, is independent of the others. And I think that is, is of great value. Um, I was in Iceland last weekend, and um, I think it's, um, I, I found something funny, so I wanted to put these slides in. So it's good for push and pull to be so explicit, but if you look at the doors, it's actually not that explicit as to what they do. They denote the, you know, how to operate this door, but now look at Icelandic signs. You know how to open these doors. <laughs> You know, they scream at you. This is how you open me. You might also rip them apart, but you know. <laughs> so for the structure of the app, now there is a, se a second component. And I, you know, it's, it's, getting, it's getting to be bold because it is provably independent. Um, we still have that email sign up around. Um, and so we got a little bit more structure. Is that cool so far? OK. Um, so let's do that. Um, now, gems make up a portion um, of apps. But if I have dependencies towards anything Rails, um, I have to do a lot of homework myself. But um, in the next step, what I want to call the Rails component app, I'm still going to do that for a Rails component. Um, so I want provable structure for Rails. The way to do this, or easily, is with Rails engines. If, if a Rails engine were actually a train engine, right, then Ruby, a Rails application would actually be a train. So you might re want to reconsider to call the whole thing Ruby and trains. Um, but I, I still have to clarify, I think, um, that Engines have still this wrong perception as being for pagination and generic administration and authentication. They are not. If you look at the docs, it says Rails engines allow you to wrap a specific Rails application or a subset of functionality and share it with other applications or within a larger packaged application. I should know because I pushed that change last time I gave a talk like this. Um, so it's very good that it says that now. So let's look at what that means. Um, so now we have, uh, next to this gems folder, we also have an engines folder. And now you're allowed to notice that the app folder went away. Since we only had one controller and I just pulled something out, there's no longer any necessity for this app to contain any code itself. It only contains gems. Let's start with the, with the more self-contained one. Email sign up. If we go in here, um, there is still that entry. Um, and it's now within a module and within a gem, which is incidentally also an engine, which if you don't uh, know a lot of, about them, check out the source code or find out about more. Um, I can't go into more detail, but I'm happy to do that in questions. So uh, essentially, this means I have uh, my database migrations in here. I have tests for this. It runs independently. Um, and the main app, as before, um, just includes those gems and references them. Let's quickly look at the teaser, because the teaser is now what contains uh, the controller it did before. And I actually also want to point out that the screen's too small, but that the teaser contains asset controllers and views, in my example here. Uh, it does not contain models, because it doesn't have any data itself. Uh, the email sign-up only has the model. It has only this entry thing. Uh, the teaser thus must be getting that, uh, that data from somewhere else. And indeed it does. It too um, requires email sign-up to be present. And it references that dependency, of course, in the gem spec so that it's actually a valid uh, gem definition. But within the controller, I believe Ah, almost nothing has changed. I also changed something about this entry manager. If you look at the code, you can find more about that here. But essentially, it's still the same. We're still just accessing the, the entry. 
Um, so that's cool. I should maybe look at the build scripts at this point, or I should have uh, done that a while ago. But um, so um, since I have all these independent components, I no longer just say rspec spec. Um, so the, the top um, block there just runs everything in the main app, which I think is just one test, which kind of loads up the whole thing um, and sees that nothing breaks. Then we uh, go into the email sign-up engine and have model specs there. And then we go into the teaser engine and test the controllers, then ha have requests in the teaser, request specs, Jasmine specs in the teaser, and then still the test for the annoyance. So it's all in one. You could split this up. At this point, you can, you can all parallelize these on Jenkins, and they're all just a few seconds long. Um, but you could have, for this app that does nothing, you could have about six parallel builds at this point, um, which is awesome because you just need to um, slap a machine on there if you're still not happy with uh, the amount of um, parallel testing that your, your build server can do. Um, so the new structure, uh, a shrinking rails app up top, a big teaser engine that controls um, what the app can do, email sign up for data storage, and the annoyance gem just, just what it did before. Did anyone see a code smell around single responsibility in any of what I've been showing. I will give a hint. Did anyone see a code smell around single responsibility? <laughs> um, there is a thing here that is an email sign-up entry, and it contains the number of tries you, you took to, to enter your email. It, it's not very visible. But if you think about what the output of such a table is, when you finally publish your announcement, what do you want to do? You want to send out emails to all the people. Why the heck would this table want to know about how many times someone tried to do that? It doesn't. This thing knows too much. Again, please bear with me and extrapolate. 100 files, and this is everywhere, and you're, you're, you have uh, a couple of your god classes, and you're never going to refactor them. So we might as well do it now. Um, Shoot, what was my number? Ah, number five. Um, so I want to get to a next point and um, make that problem go away. Um, I want to get to clearer responsibilities. Um, I will introduce what I've dubbed the event counter. Every time I try to sign up, it's kind of an event. But um, because of the requirements of my app, I actually am not interested in, in uh, seeing every event. I just want to count them. So uh, looking at code, we have uh, just introduced an event counter uh, engine in this case. It comes with a new uh, class, event logger. It can log, and it just uses a generic object identifier and an event identifier. You pass it in, what you get back is a count of the number of tries that you've already, or number of times that you've already logged this. The, um, the teaser controller has uh, changed a little bit. It has an, injects another dependency down here. It now uses this event logger. But other than that, you still see that code's essentially the same. Okay. <laughs> um, OK. So, I got rid of this, um, uh, of this, these, these two roles that the entry had. Again, you might say that didn't make sense at this point, and I would agree. It, but it does make sense. And if you're saying event counter, that's kind of a, that's kind of a stupid engine. I would never write that. Then I don't know if anyone would say that. But for an example where this engine might be used, I don't know how Facebook is doing their likes. But imagine the event is just a, face, uh, is just a status post. And uh, like is the action. Why would they not want to have that in a separate engine where they can potentially, as we just learned, use Redis within Postgres to just make the, uh, the storage and the query for that faster? If it doesn't need to be together, um, it, 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 doesn't, it shouldn't be together. So maybe more loosely coupled instead of this lousy coupling that was there before. Um, I quickly went over this this logger class, and I want to come back to it, but uh, call it 
my sixth iteration on the, uh, on the architecture, and that is the service-oriented app. And uh, I will not be talking about SOA, uh, not talk about HTTP SOA, that's point eight. <laughs> uh, this is just the service pattern, um, which you can, for example, also find in Eric Evans' book. Um, if you look at the, where is he, at the logger, um, I've done a few things here. So the first thing you might notice is that there is this active record class down there. It's private. No, it's not. Um, you cannot make a class private like this. But that, you know, to me that right now that doesn't matter. Um, because I just wanted to note that you're not supposed to use it. This count class will just store the count that we want to use in the logger. But what we're really offering here is what I want to call a service class, namely the logger, which gives me one method. <coughs> hey, you can log an event, and here's the identifier. Um, the reason I want to do this is reduce surface area. If you have not seen Justin Searle's talk on uh, mocking and testing, he has a good points about that. But just some quick numbers. If you look at how many methods are on those two classes, the count and the logger, it's way less on the logger. And if you subtract what object has, then the logger only has one method. It screams at you what you're supposed to do with it. I think that's especially important if you extract components and make them live on their own, that they properly state what they are about. And an active record class, I would say, never states what it is about, because you can always do so much stuff. And there, it's very hard to prevent it. So the structure doesn't change, but we have a, a, just the event counter, the one in the middle here, has a much clearer, um, uh, says much clearer what its intent is. Uh, number seven, and now I don't need to switch to code, but you may have been wondering why, or if I finally you know, take one of these gems uh, and rip it out. And I'm, in practice, I, I have done that but only after months on a project when pretty much one project was done and the next one was started and we realized, oh, that gem is actually one where we're interfacing with the client's uh, main architecture and that's all repetitive stuff. And you're two steps away from that. Gem build, gem push, and you have a gem. So I'm actually not gonna pull up the code because it's, it's just literally that engine vanishing from the source code, it now lives in another directory. Uh, I also pushed it to GitHub, um, I think, yesterday. Um, and nothing else changed. Actually, one thing does change. The uh, reference to this gem in the gem spec of the teaser now has a version. And in the gem file, there's no longer the reference to that path. So again, no change in structure, only that the middle point, the event counter, is now somewhere else. Um, which brings me to my last point the HTTP SOA. And uh, so R Mar Marty Hot, who now organizes RailsConf, had this tweet uh, a few weeks ago about plenty of talk submissions on how to split your mega Rails app into services. And since my talk didn't get accepted, I'm just not going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty clear what the next steps are. We already extracted uh, an engine to do, uh, say, the event counter stuff. What are you going to do? Take, again, a tiny app, maybe Sinatra, require that gem, make one endpoint for logging. Instead of in the teaser directly going to that event counter thing, call out to the service. And if it gets more complicated, yeah, you're probably going to, um, you're going to probably want to revisit the talks, uh, two talks before me, right, so that you, you get the testing right. This pattern, out of all these structural uh, architectural patterns that I've talked about today. I've only used once, and that was for auditing, where we knew this thing is just always going to take all this data, it's never going to change, and we're not interested in it. If you do this um, while you're developing an app, you're going to be stuck with having to version stuff, maintain multiple servers. Of course, you get much more control, but in the, uh, in the grand scheme of how to structure an application, it is actually not as special as I think many make it sound. It's just one more step that you can do, but by no means have to do. That end um, imprint there is also from the stairs up, and I want to use that for one last thought. I've been running you through these eight different architectures for this tiny, tiny app, um, 
and I pretend like the HTTP SOA is up there, like it's a staircase. Um, what's funny about when you get up to the top and when it's not raining is it looks pretty pretty up there, so again, you should go up there. But also, these two steps, beginning and end, they're right next to each other. They just face in different directions. And so I think much more appropriate than this staircase is a circle, because as soon as I painted that next block and I had a new app, I can start asking all these questions again. And I bet you every one of you has touched one or pretty much all of these at some point in some application. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs>